Hello, Relatable community. In this next episode, I speak with Greg Piper, owner of Exposed Temptations Tattoo Studio, and he's a freelance photographer for the Discovery Channel. Greg defied all odds by growing up in a small town in rural Pennsylvania, and there really weren't an, a lot of options for him to leave. He found his way by joining the military, and after that experience, he started a thriving and strong tattoo studio business. He was able to use his creative skills to do that and then forge a path for his photography. Greg is someone who is super enthusiastic, has a lot of energy, and is determined. And you can't help but feel like you can take on the world after listening to this episode. You also need to check out his photos at Greg Piper Arts on Instagram. You don't want to miss it. Enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Relatable. Thank you, Greg, for joining us. We're here talking with Greg Piper, who is the owner of Exposed Temptations Tattoo. Did I get that right? Yeah, you did. Oh, yay! <laughs> um, and is also a freelance uh, photographer, which we're going to talk about both careers and how you found your way and navigated your way through these careers. And then you've also done a brief stint in the military, which I want to talk about that too. Uh, so grateful to have you here. I feel like we've been planning this for a while. And because you're so uh, in demand and you've had so many opportunities to go do great things, um, you know, we finally found the time to get together. So I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. So at first, let me, let's talk about the, the tattoo business and, and how that came to be and when you fell in love with it and just how did you um, become someone that was an expert in being able to run a business in that because we've never had a tattoo artist on our <laughs> show yet. Well it came about uh, I grew up uh, my stepdad rode motorcycles was in a motorcycle club uh, so I was always around motorcycles and, and in that time in the 80s um, that was uh, tattooing was very different than it is today and so mostly it was just bikers uh, things things of that nature. Right. And so, yeah, I always, I mean, I spent my high school uh, career airbrushing uh, jean jackets or painting jean jackets. Uh, oh. And so that naturally just kind of transitioned into <laughs> doing Went from fabric covers. to exactly. skin. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I always knew that I wanted uh, to tattoo back then. I liked the uh, kind of rebellious uh, aspect of it. You know, uh, people didn't get them done. It was kind of underground. It was uh, more taboo. And just made it made it exciting. Like the kind of the the like racy side of it, or that it's kind of provocative, right? Like, exactly. It was uh, it was just a different culture back then. Everything was. I mean, um, you know, um, the motorcycles, the Harleys. None of it was mainstream. All of it was very um, kind of underground and right. different. And it was. Uh, I like that part. Were you a rebel? Growing you up? No, I don't. I don't I, I, yeah, maybe a little. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a disruptor? A rule uh, breaker? <laughs> <laughs> being a middle child, yeah, I think that it was. Uh, <laughs> you know, my younger brother got most of the attention and my older sister. And so I kind of like just fell yeah. in between. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was always doing art, always drawing. Uh, I found that an escape, uh, you know, uh, something I could, uh, I could, you know, just. Uh, kind of consume my time and I love doing it. Yeah, love it. Tell, yeah tell me about that, the, the art part of it. So in terms of being a young person, would it, would it be doodling or were you, were you sketching? Like, tell me about how you cultivated that the artistic side of yourself and did you ever take classes in art or any sort of real like formal instruction or is all just naturally, you're just, you, you know, know, I, did, I took did. Uh, art classes in high school, things like that, but yeah. I always was just drawing, um, uh, you know, skulls, roses, tattoo type of stuff. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with Iron Maiden, but yeah. I probably did a hundred Iron Maiden jean jackets or uh, like a Judas Priest jean jackets. You know, back in the 80s where we had those Levi jean jackets and they were equipped with yes. that perfect panel on the yes. back that you would uh, paint for people. So I, I don't know, it's just always in the, uh, I guess you call it doodling, you know, from the time back in when we were in school, mm -hmm. uh, when you have book covers, you know, and you could you could draw on those on brown the, paper yeah. book covers. Yes. So, uh, yeah, you know, I was just always fascinated with things like that, the bands like Kiss and then the hair bands of the uh, 80s and stuff, you know, so. Did you get paid for the jackets? I did. You did? did? Yeah, yeah. How much did you charge, do you remember? Uh, 75 to 100 bucks. Depending really? On. Yeah, so back then that was pretty good. That's, That's pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> Gas was like 79 cents a gallon, so yeah, that was, that was pretty good. That's um, awesome. And so in terms of, um, I, I do like to talk to people about this sometimes because I think it helps people that maybe are, um, 
in school right now and thinking about they what what they want to do or even like struggling um, to to figure that out. How how did you do academically? Like in terms of being, you know, you sometimes hear like the super creative sorts, right? In terms yeah. of the traditional academics, not as easy. Tell me about like what kind of student you were. How how were you? Well, I graduated with honors. I had a fourteen hundred SAT, which was pretty good back then. <laughs> That's um, still pretty good, I think. It, it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my ASVAB score uh, was high. Uh, I had college offers, but back then we didn't have like the student pro loan programs of today. Uh, so, you know, my family didn't have a lot of money, and so yeah. my options were uh, the military um, or or go to work. And so, uh, you know, uh, schools didn't offer um, the oh, kind of programs really? they have. Today, yeah, back when I was a kid graduating, uh, it was basically just, you know, the wealthy kids went to college and, and the rest of us didn't. And growing up in Pittsburgh. Is that where um, you guys have? Is that where you grew up? Yeah. And so I had a very middle class family until the early 80s when the steel mills closed. And then, of course, my stepdad and my mom lost their jobs. And with uh, between the two of them, there were six of us uh, kids. Wow. So it was, uh, you know, resources financially were, were quite limited. So uh, I originally wanted to go. Uh, to the Art Institute or, or college to get an art degree. Glad I didn't because uh, pretty much useless uh, degree. <laughs> I, that was a, we, one of my questions. Did you know, like, they, mm -hmm. you, you knew early on that art was, or something artistic was going to be of your course, path? yeah. Like, I get a lot of kids today that want to come in and learn tattoo and they have fine art degrees. And uh, interesting. art is always in the eye of the beholder, right? But when you, one of the things I think we run into today with, with, with uh, our children and career choices is there is this line between this is what I want to do and then what can I make a living doing and sometimes those are often different I see so many kids that come in and they have things like philosophy degrees you know even I have a master in philosophy uh, with a minor in fine art and they're working at drive through and Starbucks philosophizing between the difference of skim milk and, and almond milk you know because it's a useless degree and I think not enough parents tell their uh, look at their kids and tell them that I have a daughter getting ready to go on a doctoral program for psychology and when she was young she wanted to be you know, a singer or a rock star. Right. If you've ever heard her sing in the shower, you would know that that wasn't uh, in the realm of possibilities. And not that I, <laughs> not that I discourage kids from from pursuing dreams and things like that. Uh, it, it, it's just that you know a lot of the kids come out with fine art degrees, and it's not transferable into any sort of career. And again, it's not to discourage them that they can't uh, be that one in a million that that do something uh, great with it. But most of the artists I find that I hire have, really have no formal training. Art. When it comes to the art of tattooing, you know, we draw things like that. That's that's either an ability somebody is born with, in my opinion, or it's, it's something you, you can't refine to a point that is uh Yeah. How many tattoos do you have? You know, I've never sat down and counted, but <laughs> uh, I, And do I, I, you I do know. your own or is it always someone else has to do it too? Uh, right? I, I tattooed the insides of my legs, which is very common for tattooers. When I was uh, apprenticing you had to tattoo yourself. Um but it's uh, it's changed significantly, and so uh, yeah, most of the tattoos I have, I got when I was very young, um, and and if I could start over, I would erase them. I would have traditional Japanese sleeves, but probably none of the tattoos, maybe one or two that I currently have, I would retain. Really, uh, really. Today, yeah. And each one is there a specific meaning behind what, like when you got it, or yeah, like this one. We were bored and there was no customers, <laughs> <laughs> so we tattooed yeah, one another. Space. Right now, yeah. no, most of them are just, uh, just like that, in you know, the moment. Was, yeah, kind of young in the moment. Where like, hey, uh, what I have is better than most uh, tattooers. You'll find that most tattooers have the worst tattoos. Really? Um, yeah, a lot of them kind of practice or do things with their, you know, friends when they're younger, and so uh, yeah, that seems to be the case. Tell me a little bit about the military because you mentioned that. So, did you go into the military from high school? I did. Yes. And I, that was that a choice given like what was available to you and the choices that you had. Like that was a lane that you thought could give you opportunity. It was. It was. Uh, I was an ROTC in high school, uh, and so I went. I went to basic and AIT between eleventh, uh, twelfth grade on uh, what was originally called a delayed entry program uh, into the reserves. And then when I graduated high school, I uh, came on active duty, uh, and so yeah, it was a, the military was a, a couple things. It was uh, I, I like the structure, I like the discipline uh, aspect of it, and it got me out of of McKeesport, Pennsylvania, and uh, yeah. you know it, it presented me with some different opportunities. A, I wanted to travel, see the world. I've always been drawn to. Uh, travel things like since I was a kid, I've wanted to climb Everest. I've wanted to do all these things in places around the world. And now I've been lucky enough. I've probably been to seventy, close to seventy-five percent of the world's countries. 
Uh, so I keep checking that list off, although it never seems to get shorter because I always have something at the bottom. But yeah, the military did that. It gave me an opportunity to get out. Um, where I grew up, you either, uh, I, I, people that I grew up with are either uh, dead in jail or still working the same kind of 7-Eleven type jobs uh, that they did before. Pittsburgh uh, is one of those unique places where I witnessed uh, a, a working middle class uh, transition to, to more of a welfare uh, class, especially in the key sport. Uh, since since I've been gone, so wow, and that's hard to see. It is, it is, you know, and, yeah. Especially a lot, of, you know, you have a lot of people have fond memories of their childhood and where they grew up, and to kind of see that um, decline, that's that's got to be tough. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's 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 like I said, you, you see this whole transition. The town of Keysport uh, kind of just went away. Yeah, you know, you have. Uh, People that were hardworking took an immense amount of pride in that and ended up, you know, exhausted of all the part-time jobs they could do because when you lose the mills or you lose that core, you lose the surrounding area and just deteriorates right. as well. Uh, all the jobs become non-existent. And they had this sense of pride and, and you know, didn't want welfare, didn't want assistance. And, of course, growing up on government cheese and even before that, uh, you know, the strikes. Uh, my, my parents would be on a strike all the time. So you had the union hall getting government cheese and flour and peanut butter. And... Uh, mm. So at first, that's something they don't want. But four generations later, well, welfare becomes just a way of life because when you witness your parents, uh, like I witnessed my parents going to work, uh, when you witness your parents going to the mailbox and receiving a check and you don't see an example of someone that works day in and day out, right. it becomes very easy. And I'll ask friends, I'm like, hey, why don't, why don't you leave? You know, get out. There's programs that have been over, over the years that uh, will retrain you in different vocational uh, right. technical jobs, relocate you. But uh you know, it's kind of like that movie. It's a White mindset, Boy. right? It is a mindset. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever watch the movie White Boy Rick, where he says, uh, "Son of Lion never leaves the Serengeti," it's a very similar thing. Where they're, hey, we this is where we live, and where we're close to only the options that are here, nothing outside of that. What do you think propelled you to to leave? Like, if, <laughs> if that is the construct, and not not a lot of people get out and leave, right? What is it about you that gave you the courage to say? Because, like, I think going to the military is scary, right? Like, you don't know what lies ahead or what situation you may be put in and even though it was a way out like do, are you someone that has like your you don't have a lot of fear like are you someone that is you know it's not that I don't have a lot of fear I, I probably have a lot more faith uh, I, I've always lived my life uh, even through these last two years of COVID uh, we will all die and, and I believe that God has a plan for me and that's predetermined and uh, yeah. I, I don't I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it you know uh, Yes, I can get killed going to Everest. Yes, you can get killed jumping out of a plane. You can get killed walking across the street uh, to Seven Eleven. You know, you can. Uh, right. And so, I, for me personally, I don't understand people that live with a great deal deal of fear. For me, the idea of going in the military, going anywhere, it's like stepping on a plane for the first time and going someplace. It's exciting to me. You know, I like the idea of maybe I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. Um, yeah. Or or where you're going to be. There's all these different things we can experience. And, and fear is, is probably the number one reason people don't experience it or we put yeah. obstacles in front of ourselves uh, or always like, why well, can't do this because or, or this? Um, to me, it's, you know, it, people say all the time, oh, you're lucky. I'm not lucky, I'm blessed. But I live a life that I design specifically that's because that's the way yeah. I, I wanted to live. What branch of the military did you go into? The Army. And how long were you part of that? Eight years. Eight years. Mm -hmm. And then um, from your, what was your focus in the mil? Like, did, there was a specific... Yes, ma'am, I was infantry. You were infantry, yeah. okay. And then um, <clears throat> when you were transitioning out, well, maybe I'll just ask a couple questions about that. What was that experience like? It was awesome. I mean, and, my best my best friends <laughs> still today. Yeah. You've got this kind of brotherhood, people that are in yeah. fraternities or with women, uh, you know, sororities. You, you build this bond, uh, that's incredible. And we tend to remember the fun times, you know, all the all the antics and the, and the, the things we did. Uh, I mean, the, the military in between all those fun memories is a lot of, a lot of sh uh, strict uh, structure and boredom, uh, mm. especially in the combat arms. Uh, MLS, there's not much to do uh, in between training and stuff, but uh, it was a blast, I loved it, you know, uh, I mean, I got to experience some incredible things, meet some incredible people, got, got some travel out of it. Uh, I, I, I was in the old guard uh, for a portion of that and, uh, you know, got to, uh, got a White House clearance, so I got to stand next to the Presidents Clinton and then Bush before him. So uh, those, those things were exciting and cool, you know. Uh, 
but it was it was a great time in my life. I, I meet a lot of people who never leave that part of their life, regardless of how long they've been. You know, um, right? It's like this uh, this this syndrome where it's like, hey, these were the greatest times. You see some sorority ex mm -hmm. ex athletes that do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to ever make that transition. You know, they kind of live. That was like the glory point of their life, uh, where I'm less about that and, and, and more about what I'm doing currently or what I have going on. What's going next? Yeah. So yeah. then tell me about that decision to leave. And then what was the next step for you after you left? <laughs> well, they, the did, um, they cut out the bear program, which means they weren't given any reenlistment. Uh, they were, there was a, uh, a Q course and they could go to special forces and get uh, about 52,000 at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't giving that. They were giving us money to get out because Clinton was cutting back the military. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I had the, the opportunity to uh, what they call ETS, I just decided, hey, I can always come back to the military, but mm -hmm. let me get out and uh, opened up my studio. And that you like right away, that was the first thing. Like, yeah, I sold, uh, I tattooed and, and I sold cards for six months to get money. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, you know, um, opened my shop in Manassas and I've been doing that. That's <laughs> ever, amazing. Ever since. That is amazing. And then I should have asked this were, were you deployed? When uh, you, when I, I you... was. Uh, just prior to getting out in 94, I had spent a year in Somalia. Um, and so, yeah, it was. Uh, it was cool. My, my, uh, my, the, the time in Africa was, was awesome. Uh, getting deployed, getting to see, uh, that side of the military and, uh, yeah, it was, it was good. Let's just talk, I want to talk about photography too, but in terms of the, the, your tattoo studio and, and your business. And one of the things you said before that I think is interesting and, and something for people to consider is this idea, this intersection of like doing what you love, whether it's a creative pursuit or something mm -hmm. else. And then the reality of running a business or having to make money. Okay. And how do you how do you retain the excitement and the love for the thing that you you love to do, right? When when on the business side it can be difficult or it can be, you know, when you're um, having challenges. It's almost like you know, what's what's to keep someone from just keeping the art because it's something you love to do and that's more of just a hobby versus like now you've integrated these two things. So tell me about how the business has grown for you or or that or growing into that yourself just you know obviously leaving the military and starting a studio it's not like you were necessarily had a ton of business experience so just tell me about right. how that's evolved for you relatable is sponsored by tfa soft skills your one-stop shop for workshops coaching speaking and soft skills development if you'd like to hire teresa visit www tfasoftskills.com for more information. Business is, is, a, is a learning curve. You know, right. you can choose to go to a college and get a business degree and, and learn nothing uh, because <laughs> the real world versus uh, like academics yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is, is totally different. But, you know, a lot of things happened early in my business. For instance, I had a very small studio and a church moved in next door, a Pentecostal church. And they uh, seemed cool at first, and then they tried to have me evicted uh, out of the building, uh, try to get the county involved and say that uh, what tattooing was pornographic, it was all these things. So anyhow, on Christmas Eve, I believe it was 95, they were thrown out because they didn't have the proper licensing. They never were uh, had the, the, the proper whatever you need to be to be a church. So on Christmas Eve, uh, they, they actually were uh, evicted and the, the city of Manassas shut it down. So that made the front page of the Washington Post, of course, because tattoo artists gets church thrown out on Christmas Eve, right? So I'm, I'm in the shower. Oh and I, I didn't even know this yet, but I'm in the shower, and Howard Stern, who was father at the time, Yeah, Paul, he was... Right, and... and, and uh, was when he was at DC 101? Uh, yeah. Right? And, and, was yes, he Yes, I think it was. Yeah. And he called... Uh, no, I think it was after. I think I fired from DC 101 when he, when he called Air Florida right. and asked about uh, tickets to the 14th Street Bridge. But uh, <laughs> prior to that... <laughs> Or so I think it was after that. I think he was syndicated. Maybe he was in New York. Anyhow, he calls. So I'm in the shower, and my girlfriend at the time said, "Hey, Howard Stern is on the radio." I thought she was messing with me. I uh, mean, on the phone. So anyhow, we did a brief uh, interview. The, uh, the next day, it made the front page of the Washington Post. Uh, the Today Show came to my studio to do a morning oh show, gosh. and instantly I had to go lease a bigger building, and we uh, we took off. But it's one of those things in business that I say all the time. You know, these accidental things happen. You couldn't have planned it uh, at the time. You know, I was like, "Oh my." I mean, why would you, you know, they want to throw it out. There's, right. there's, I mean, it's a legit business. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of grows. And then, uh, 
Years later, uh, Governor Warner at the time, uh, Mark Warner, who's now our senator, uh, uh, decided they wanted to regulate tattooing. So he appointed me to the Board of Barbers and Cosmetology and along with the state, we wrote tattoo regulations. Uh, that got a lot of press. I think currently 22 states use that same uh, uh, legislation. And so it was cool, got an opportunity to meet him, work with uh, the staff and the uh, state attorney general in writing uh, the rules and regulations for tattooing and the testing and, and the apprenticeship program and things that are current. And that, so uh, that kind of propelled my career a little bit because all of a sudden, if someone wanted to know something about tattooing, whether it was from our state or another state, uh, you know, they, they gave me a call. Um, so it, it was cool, it just kind of progressed. But like I said, along the way, these, these things kind of happen from the business side, you're forced to deal with it. And you learn a lot. I used to manage a lot differently than I manage now. Um, do you have a staff of people now? Or is it, because I, I would do. think everyone wants you, right? Because right. you're uh, the... Yeah. I have 15 uh, tattooers uh, yeah. and two body piercers uh, and a brand new uh, 3,000 square foot shop we just built last year in the parking lot next to the old shop. Uh, yeah, it stays extremely busy. Uh, we, we, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really busy uh, business. If you come to our shop on a Saturday morning for walk-ins only, there'll be a line of about 40 people by 1030 because we open at noon. When do you close? Like I, at the old late nine night o'clock. people, yeah, so no, you don't get the late o'clock. night. And sometimes artists will stay later. But uh, <laughs> yeah, when I, when I started. Uh, people have a few drinks. I think there's a lot of tattooing exactly. that happens after yeah, that. Yeah. Well, it doesn't happen in our suit. Okay. If we drink, we, we kick you out. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, we, we close at nine. Uh, you know, my artists are like anyone else, they have families and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I, I believe a, a nine hour work day, they don't tattoo all that nine hours, we probably tattoo about seven of it, uh, you know, eating lunch and things in between. Right. Um, but that's but that's funny. Um, what advice do you have, and then I want to start talking about some of the art, the photography, but what advice do you have for someone that is like wants to get a tattoo for the first time, right? Like, mm -hmm. and you had talked about having some regret about what you know things that you would remove. Yeah. So, what are what's a good checklist or a good thing that well, you would obviously you research consider? the artist that's going to do it, uh, okay. right? We we are not all equal. Uh, some people come in. I have personally about uh, I think my next available is July of two thousand twenty three. So it takes about uh, oh fifteen gosh. months to get an appointment with me. Uh, I'm always flattered. And anyone in your in your like in your shop too or with you personally in my shop it ranges from uh anywhere from three months to a year okay uh, that's why we leave time for walk-ins uh or, or walk-in uh, appointments on weekends things like that um but i would say definitely give some research you know uh, even within my shop people come in and like hey i want you to tattoo me and i'll say well that's not really what i do but i have another artist at the shop who specializes in that and he'll do a better job for you um and, mm -hmm. and so uh, definitely research your artist, research the location, uh, make sure your artist, especially in Virginia or Washington, D.C., is licensed. Mm -hmm. uh, go on DPOR's website, put their name in, check that out. Most importantly, uh, wait and, and really, these, these things are permanent. We see so many young kids today, this new generation that we've talked about earlier. Yeah. They're, they're like, you know, they don't, they don't hear the word no, and I'll see them come in with their parents and like, hey, this is what I want, and their parents are opposed to it, but they sign off anyhow because the kids tell them if you don't, I'll just get it someplace else. They come in, they want their knuckles tattooed or their necks of their faces, which me personally, I won't do. Uh, you know, it, it's, you've got to give it some thought. If I put on a long sleeve shirt, if I came in here today with a, with a shirt and tie on, you would never know uh, that I tattooed. I haven't personally liked it that way because there's situations in life where I don't want those things uh, this out. One, like right. they, when people look at you, they, they, they view you in a different manner. Yeah. Uh, and they do, and that's just human nature, you know. And uh, so personally, I would give some thought to your career, uh, things like that. I have a 23 year old daughter. She's getting ready to start a doctoral program and she has no tattoos and every year she wants one. Her and her girls from school come to the tattoo convention that I put on and they're like, hey, you know, and I make an announcement. Uh, if you tattoo these group of girls, you will not be welcome back next year. <laughs> and, and we've had these conversations and she's thanked yeah. me for, for, for doing that. Uh, I'm not saying don't get tattoos. Obviously, that's kind of productive for <laughs> what I do. Yeah. But give it some thought. These things are permanent. Tattoos are permanent. When someone goes in and gives you a bad tattoo, misspells something, or doesn't yeah. know what they're doing, uh, these you, you can't just go and erase it. You know, it, it's, it's painful. It takes a long time to get removed. But even more importantly, uh, if you go getting some stupid tattoo across your knuckles and you're 18 years old, you know, you need to think, hey, wh wh where, where am I going to be employed? You see so many shows, right, with these entrepreneurs, they're heavily tattooed. You watch uh, some of these uh, uh, shows on the cooking channel where mm -hmm. these chefs are competing. Uh, 
they're heavily tattooed, but these are people that have their own businesses and stuff, right? If, if your career is set, you want to go out and get your hands or your neck, uh, things like that tattooed, uh, then that's one thing. But, you know, you need to keep in mind that that might not always be the case and that people will uh, judge you, you know. Yeah, uh, for, yeah, for sure. That's amazing. I mean, what an incredible journey just on that side. So tell me cool. um, about the photography. So the way that, is everything okay? Um, tell me about, um, in terms of our introduction, right? We have a mm -hmm. mutual friend that, um, that's how I was introduced to you. She said, you have to check out Greg's photos. <laughs> These are the most <laughs> incredible photos I've ever seen. And so she sent them to me and you can, we, you, you have an Instagram following, right? Like, I do. So what's yeah, close to a million now. Um, what is your, me. your, um, handle? So it's can Greg see. Piper Arts. Okay. With Greg Piper Arts. Arts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some of the photos, I mean, I almost kind of want to, I mean, we're using my phone right now, but I like, they are extraordinary. So when did your love of photography, like, have you always had that? And how did you create space to have that also as part of what you do in terms of your kind of adult life? Like, it's, it's phenomenal. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it. Again, kind of by accident. I've always had a camera in my hand. I've always taken uh, uh, photographs uh, my entire life. I've always been, um, you know, uh, just into photography. And it was a, a hobby that started, uh, really, as, uh, underwater. I did a lot of underwater photography just as a hobby. And then it got published, and then it continued to get published. And, uh, yeah, I ended up doing, uh, you know, contributing for the Discovery Channel. Still do on a, on a regular basis. On uh, If you go on their IG, you'll see... Every year I'm up in Alaska covering uh, the grizzly bears that I, I kind of live with for about a month a year, oh uh, which is which is awesome. And don't get that confused with Tim Timothy Treadwell. I'm not up there petting them or doing anything stupid like that. But uh, When you say that, though, what do you mean by you live with them for a year? So tell so me what that and, experience and spend a month is like. in, in Katmai. Uh, so every year, uh, the bears, like right now, they're coming out of their dens. The grizzlies started about, about a month ago. Uh, they'll come down, they'll eat a lot of vegetation because it cleans out the digestive tract and they're skinny. They look like, uh, look like a German shepherd. Like if you saw them in the woods, uh, the, they're, they're tiny. Even, even, uh, Ronald Mesner, who, uh, with the Yeti, he has finally said that what he thinks he saw was a bear. They spend an immense amount of time walking on their hind legs. Uh, I don't think we know that. And when they're skinny, they very much resemble humans in, in that standing position. Uh, they use their, their hind legs to, to look, uh, to, to look over grass and stuff. So they spend a good amount of time uh, walking in that position. If you've ever seen one in the spring, they're, they're horribly skinny. Like I said, they very much resemble a, a, a large German Shepherd. But as the year goes by, they'll start clamming. Uh, and, and then they'll, the salmon will arrive in about mid-July. Uh, and then they'll consume about 100 pounds of salmon a day. Uh, until October. So in that end of that September time frame, I'll go up to Katmai and, and spend time and they're good and fat by then, but they're getting even fatter. And every year the National Park Service has a uh, fat bear week uh, that you can follow. And uh, it, it has LIDAR that they've put up that actually detect the size and, and, and weight of these bears. And they have a contest that the public can participate in and hey, which bear is getting the fattest. It's cool. It brings a lot of attention to conservation um, right. in, in, in the Katmai region. Uh, things like that, the importance of the bears to economically to the state of Alaska and, and the money that brings in. For years, we've been fighting uh, Pebble Mine, which is a, a gold mine that they've been trying to put right in the heart of uh, of Cat Mine. And so, uh, but anyhow, yeah, I go up there and look, I get up in the morning and you can go on my Instagram and you watch me walk through the river and uh, a thousand pound bear will come sit right next to me like you are. She has uh, every Stop year. Stop it. You know, the sows remember me. <laughs> One of the things do you how, remember you? They do. And one of the things they will do, they'll have cubs for three years before they kick them out. So uh, during that, that three year like period. That's a good plan. Well, <laughs> Let's get them out after three years. <laughs> that is a good plan. <laughs> but they, uh, the boars generally won't approach um, uh, people. Or, uh, so the sows, when they're trying to eat, uh, consume the salmon, which is 100 pounds for them and then 25 pounds for each cub, uh, the cubs will often interfere with that. They go out and they try to take the salmon from the mom. So she'll come on shore and leave them with me. Uh, and literally, uh, it's so funny because my She'll girlfriend... She'll leave the cubs with you? And we babysit them. Uh, the cubs will sit, uh, where, like you three are sat Stop around here. It. And they will, uh, you know, sit there with me and uh, I'll photograph them. And uh, the mom goes out and fishes. Now, I don't want people at home to think this is a normal <laughs> thing. I've spent years with these bears. And a bear, like, like they're misunderstood kind of like sharks. These animals will do a hundred things before they'll attack you. You have to be doing something galactically stupid, which a lot of tourists do. They come up, try to pet them and things like this. Uh, 
you know, so you have to study the animal uh, right, and the yeah. environment and yeah. the organ, right? And let the bears dictate, or any animal dictate the encounter. I'll stand in the river, she becomes comfortable with me after a couple of days of getting there. It's almost like they remember you. And then she starts to encroach on that space. And I'll be sitting on the side of the river like this. And, you know, it's very common for a sow to come to the grass. You know, I'll stand up. I'll talk a lot because you want to make sure the bear knows you're there. Uh, and by talking, you do that, makes them like to them. Yeah, I do. I, you know, it might sound silly, but I sit there and have conversations with her. I just came over one day and, and she put in a great video. She lumps her head on this hump of grass next to the river. She just comes up and sits and she kind of, yeah. like your dog will do when he's yeah, tired. You yeah. know, and, uh, it's because she's wore out, you know, never since three cubs or trying to feed them or keep track of them all day. Uh, but they're amazing animals. And uh, like, like most animals, I feel like animals can sense if you're going to harm them or if you have a fear of them. And so, uh, you, you know, I mean, it's important to learn uh, about your subject, right. how they behave, things like that. Uh, because a bear is going to behave differently than a leopard uh, in Africa. So you, you have to be... Uh, the, the amount of research and, and, and things you have to do, the amount of time you spend in the wild with, with guides and learning from them, people who spend uh, this kind of time with these animals. But that's the incredible part about it. The photography is kind of secondary to me for being out there. I like uh, just being out in nature. I, yeah. I'm happiest when uh, uh, I, I hate the city. Uh, I, I hate... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I like the restaurants and the things that happen in the city, but I, I, yeah. I, when I'm out in places like that, you know... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you I'm up at six in the morning um, until it gets dark in Alaska. That's midnight. Uh, you know. Yeah, like you're just so captivated by what's happening. It doesn't even feel it. You yeah. lose time. Tell me about the. Um, so, did you see the octopus teacher? I did. See the what did you think teacher. of that? Yeah, I liked it. It was, it was a good documentary. I mean, octopus are, are crazy smart animals. I think mostly the message that should be taken from that: we can all learn things from nature. Uh, we can always learn things from being out. I think the thing about it that I thought was so, and it's almost what you described with the with the bear, is that this connectedness, right? Where course, where yeah. he, the way he that to me was the way he kind of put that out there with like you're we're all connected and like Absolutely. even a, a dude and an octopus, right? Like yeah, after you, you spend time, yeah. there's like it just that to I me. I mean, you get what, that connection with your dog. Right, right. And, right. And dogs know different from from other animals. Yeah. I mean, they they, they have uh, feelings, intellect, empathy. These things. I mean, if you spend time in the wild, uh, you, you see it. Uh, yeah. And like anything else, you know, it's uh, uh, people just get this impression I'm going to go out and some wild bear is going to attack me, uh, and that's not not true. It happens, right? right. But most times it happens because people aren't aware of the bear uh, even being there. They startle an animal or they get between it and his cubs. And so there are always situations, or even in Katmai, would I interact with those bears the same way in late October? Not at all. When the salmon are there, the uh, bears are there to eat salmon. And when I say millions of salmon, if they could sustain your weight, you could walk across lakes and rivers on them. They are packed in there and they have one thing in mind to get back to where they were born to lay these eggs. Uh, right. And the bears are there just to consume them. When that food source is gone, uh, like if you watch the show with Timothy Trevo, he say very late into October, uh, he made the mistake of petting bears, having physical contact with them. And, and I think with him, he, mm. he was delusional in the fact that he actually began to think he was part of their family. Right. Uh, and right. that's just not, that's just not the case. Um, regardless, um, when you stay late into the season like that, uh, you know, yeah, you, you are, your chances of becoming a food source are much higher. Um, Tell me about the lions, because you've done lions mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I'm getting ready to go to Botswana next week. So I'll be over there for, for a couple weeks and then come back and I'll be in South Africa this summer and uh, with my girls, my daughters, and then going to an amazing place in South Africa called Tiger Canyon. Really? Uh, oh, you should look it up. Uh, some conservationists in, in Africa, and I don't know if you know this, tigers were indigenous all over the world through through the African continent, uh, continent as well. Um, and so they've reintroduced them, and it's been 25, 24 years now. So they took tigers, put them in the wild, now they're six generations deep into living in the wild and hunting in, in a, in a 7,000 hectare reserve in South Africa called Tiger Canyon. Unbelievable, you can go there, and it's gonna be my first time. It's just recently opened to the public, and this will be my first opportunity to go, and I'm taking my daughter's with me to go out and I'll photograph some, some tigers in the wild. Because you can go to places like Sumatra, uh, India, not a huge fan of the crowds in India, mm -hmm. Sumatra, uh, the, the deforestation, things like that. They're in less and less habitat. So it's very hard to see. Um, actually, very few people know that um, um, in um, uh, 
Nepal, which mm -hmm. is a huge tiger population as well, uh, and in Russia, uh, but I don't think that's open anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm excited about that. Um, so, yeah, I'll spend a lot of time in Africa this year, and I think in August, we're back in Kenya and Tanzania. How close do you get to them? Like, I mean, obviously, your the pictures you take look like you're really... Really close. Six hundred millimeter lens will make it look like you're very close. But no, they get they get right to the vehicles. Anybody that's been on a safari, how, mm -hmm. how it works in, in Africa um, is they have these huge reserves that are obviously fenced in. As as in the last uh, quarter century, we've lost we've gone from one hundred thousand wild lions to uh, just over twenty thousand. Uh, as the world populates, mm -hmm. especially places like Africa, uh, places where traditionally, uh, like my guide Maji has five wives and fifteen kids. Well, 100 years ago, maybe two or three of those kids would make it to adulthood. You had things like malaria, right. different diseases, uh, things like that, that took its toll. Uh, today, you know, 12 of those 12 children will, will live to adulthood uh, with, you know, malaria medications, now vaccines for malaria, different things. They're living longer, so they need more food. And so f farming has uh, continued to grow there yeah. in a lion. Do I want to chase a, a uh, kudu that can, you know, run at 40 miles an hour? I want to go eat this cattle uh, that isn't moving. You know, it's a, a domesticated type of animal, and it's always easier to do that. So what the, the farmers do is they end up taking a cattle, shooting it, poisoning it. So when the lions come up, they eat it. So we've lost a, a ton of lions due to things uh, like that and just human expansion. So most of these game reserves are fenced in their huge Kruger National Park uh, all, all the way across. It consists of def different... Uh, game reserves where the animals roam free uh, between them. So it's as wild as you can get, but the downside to it is these animals have grown up with these safari vehicles. Right. And so they don't identify me or you. The reason people on safari wear tan or green colored clothing is because it doesn't contrast with the vehicles. Uh, they don't see you as a, a, they see you as part of this vehicle they've always grown up with. Now, the minute you step out of that vehicle, then that changes the game, uh. which is why they don't get out of the vehicle. So when I shoot, I'll get under the vehicle and shoot from there. Uh, a couple times leopards have come up and they kind of give you a little, if you're leaning too far out and let you know that, uh, you know, that, that they recognize you. But usually it's like everything else. They're going on with their daily lives. They're hunting, they're eating, they're doing whatever. Uh, a lot of times young cubs will get, climb up, try to climb on the vehicles. Uh, the guys will always make sure they shoo them off because you don't want uh, them to be too comfortable. Right. You get more than, hey, I can just jump up uh, in, in, in this thing here. So, uh, no, I don't think there's a, a huge fear of it. Uh, in Botswana next week, I'll, I'll be taking over my, one of my mountain bikes and going out mountain biking on these reserves, which is going to be cool to not have a vehicle. Uh, but I will have some guys with me. Totally, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and then tell me about underwater. So what's, uh, like, what 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 is the coolest uh, experience you've had underwater? Well, uh, I've had a lot of cool encounters underwater, but my favorite part of diving is always that first second when you, uh, you know, step off the boat. You just get this rush of water around you. You're descending in this clear blue, and it's the most peaceful moment uh, I, I can describe. It's 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 silent. It's beauty. It's just you kind of free floating through this water column. Uh, and when you're places like um, the Caribbean is nice, but the Caribbean has 650 species of coral and fish. The Indo-Pacific has 6,500. Uh, and and the amount of fish in places like the Indo-Pacific and the Verde Pass uh, is incredible in the Philippines. There's so many fish that sometimes it annoys me as a photographer. I'll be trying to take a picture of a turtle or a whale shark and there's a million fusiliers between me and the subject and it's kind of yeah. like, <laughs> I wish. But at the same time, it's, it's an incredible beauty. Uh, I, I love uh, being underwater. Probably because not a, not, it's, not a lot of people do it, especially in exotic places. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's, there's a lot of people that, uh, that go out and it's busy, but it's very small operations uh, comparatively. And so uh, that's one of the things I, I like about it. I like uh, to be out there in nature without a lot of people <laughs> around me. I tend to shoot and things I do uh, yeah. by myself. Last year I did some guiding and found out very quickly I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like yeah. it so much. I do some workshops and I'm always happy to help people with photography and things like that. Uh, and, and I enjoy that, but, but out in the wild, I enjoy um, the solitude of, of being uh, more alone than, than having groups. Uh, I find that guided, large guided groups in places like Alaska are, are probably, uh, the, the, uh, they're, they're not safe, they, they're impactful on the animals. Right. Uh, I was talking to uh, some, some uh, park rangers from Katmai National Park in Brooks Falls, 
And we set a record last year. By June 30th, more people had visited Katmai than in the history of the park. Uh, and you just can't have that kind of impact on the animals. The animals aren't there as a zoo to be viewed. Right. right? They're, they're eating, they're busy doing their things. Last year we had very high water, we had great snow, so it was very high uh, runoff. The rivers were high. Bears, believe it or not, drowning is one of the number one uh, causes oh. of cub, cub death. Uh, bears cannot, uh, even though they spend a lot of time what we call snorkeling, when they're head underwater, they can't breathe underwater. And so when you are surrounded by tourists and the bears don't have other places to go, uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's detrimental to them. So I'm hoping that the park uh, instills some sort of uh, uh, regulations on the amount of people it, it, it allows there uh, because it is starting to have a, a huge negative impact. In such as, I'm sorry, no, eco, I, ecotourism in itself, right? We have yeah. this ecotourism thing we do. Well, yeah, we don't use plastic straws. Uh, they use plastic cups. But they don't use plastic straws, right? They have all these things, and it's been huge. But the amount of people out in the wild, if you look at our national parks in the United States, let's say you want to go to Camp 4 in Yosemite. Yeah, maybe 2028, you can get a spot in the campground. Right. Uh, they're sold out. So many people are outdoors doing things, which is, which is great that people are outside and enjoying that. But th there is sustainability limits um, right. in, in everything. And with the bears in Alaska, it's one of those things that started to get um, too much, I think. Just too many people and it's starting to impact the behavior. W one quick question back to the underwater just for a second in terms yeah. of do you go to repeat places? If you'd like to advertise with Relatable, please email us at info at tfasoftskills.com for more information. I, I have some places I love. Uh, Palau is one of those places uh, that I love. And do they, similarly, will they, like, will, will, will they recognize you or no? Like Animals, no. Yeah. So you don't have... It's not uh, the same. Like, things like bears, uh, like around here in Virginia, a black bear will spend its entire life, uh, life in two square miles. Right. Uh, they just right. don't, uh, they don't travel a lot. Uh, in Alaska, those same bears will come. And what brings the bears to those rivers is the fish, right? So here you have Bristol Bay. You have all these streams and rivers uh, that come out of that. So as the fish migrate up to them and get higher and higher, the bears simply move with them. So I know what week they're going to be at mm -hmm. the American River. You know what week they're going to be at the Kulik River because they'll follow the fish. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, uh, very simple. Now, some of them will stay in Brooks Falls. Some of the bears don't move. They'll go back to their same den. Same in Africa, you know, prides of lions live in the same place. Leopards are territorial. There are, there's one, there's one dominant male and he will allow females to go through. In fact, a female leopard will often breed with several males. She will be pregnant and she knows this, but she will go out and, and breed with other males. And why she does that is because the male doesn't know who the father is. The male only knows that he breeds with her. So when she has those cubs, she can walk through his territory without fear of those cubs being killed because that male knows he bred with her. Now she walked through that territory with a male that did not breed with her, then he would kill those cubs because he sees it as a threat. Mm. So nature is very much like that. Bears are very much the same way. A uh, female bear won't not go into estrus if she has cubs. And so if she has a singular cub and a male wants to mate with her, a lot of times he'll kill that cub uh, because then the bear will go back in estrus and, and, and the male can mate with her. So uh, that's that's kind of downside of nature. <laughs> but it, it is brutal. We think dating <laughs> as humans is bad. Exactly. So underwater, you get migratory things like uh manta rays uh right whale sharks things that you can predict will be in those areas but, but it's not the, not the same they, they have so much more exactly yeah exactly uh tell me about just the so you've described you're obviously very busy human right because you have <laughs> i mean you almost have two what seems to me like two full-time careers I do. and yeah. so um tell me about like your stamp, your stamina to do that. Maybe your like. We'll sometimes ask people, and it's like coming to me now as we're chatting. Like, mm -hmm. what are some of the like rituals and habits, right, that you have in your life that help you? Because that requires a ton of stamina. You're like traveling around the world. You're you've got a huge business that you're driving with multiple people that that you're responsible for in terms of reporting into your business, mm -hmm. and then this like passion side of your life. So tell me, like, how do you how do you create? Um, balance for yourself like do you have any tips on things that you do that if you found you know to be successful in terms of your own mm -hmm. like habits like i said rituals anything that people can maybe steal from you well the first thing is is i have two very different but but equally creative jobs and so one feeds the other yeah. uh like after 
I'm usually home tattooing for about three weeks, and then uh, two to three weeks, and I'm gone for two to three weeks. And so it's it's a like great that's balance. That's the rhythm that it, you find. It yeah. is, and and uh, uh, you know, yes, it takes. Uh, I have a first off, I have a great crew at work. I have an excellent uh, manager, uh, uh, and then I have an incredible personal assistant. And so uh, the shop uh, runs uh, yeah. well without me, but uh, I, I love tattooing. So it's it's like this great. Um, Kind of great roller coaster rhythm. I'm, I'm excited to be back tattooing, and then I'm excited to go on a trip. You know, I have different things packed, so I know if I'm going to Africa, I'm taking this, I'm taking uh, that underwater. But uh, and, and then it's something I get to share with my daughters. Uh, you know, they travel uh, quite a bit with me. Uh, but that's probably the biggest obstacle is is, is time away. You know, you, I get homesick. There's nothing like your bed. Right. And one day when I can invent a bed that like shrinks down into a suitcase size <laughs> and you can take it with you, it'd be awesome. But uh, I, I spend a lot of time flying, a lot of time uh, out in, in a way. The most important thing is is knowing uh, those boundaries and those limits and knowing, hey, it's okay to stay home for a while. It's okay to... Uh, uh, you know, to, to, to keep that pace up. But I always look forward to the end of October when pretty much my travel dies down. I, I have a week that uh, me, me and my girlfriend will go down to Cayman uh, or something usually right before my birthday at Thanksgiving. But it's very much, uh, you know, a, a balance. But the, 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 I don't know, my routine is I'm, I'm active. I, I was going to say, what about like sleep, working out, being, nutrition, yeah. all that stuff? I can't stand being right? idle and yeah. I'm, I'm a freak about organics. Okay. Uh, so... My mains, I eat uh, meat, fish, and vegetables. Is, is basically I don't do like no ours. processed, yeah. right? Don't eat any processed food. Everything is uh, organic or whole or, or locally sourced. Do um, you have um, an occasional beverage or no? No, nah, I mean, I'll drink rarely. I'll, I'll have a lemon drop martini <laughs> on occasion. Uh, <laughs> I but not can't much. even see that. <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> you go on my Instagram, there's a picture of me pinky out drinking my lemon drop. When you're six six two fifty. Now a lot of people laugh at you when you order it. They may laugh later. But I love it. But anyhow, yeah, I get up. My normal day is I'm up at six. I do my social media in the morning, and, yeah. uh, and then then I work out, uh, and I do that five days a week. And then I'm always mountain biking or climbing. I don't count any of those things. Uh, you know, I try, I try to stay in shape at 52. Um, yeah. You know, it, it becomes a little harder, but the year after next, I want to go back to Everest and, uh, uh, you know, uh, do a summer. And you've done that all I, I have been. Yes, ma'am. I went in uh, 2017. Uh, so you... Uh, and made it and did the whole no, thing? No, I did. I uh, was oh. doing, just going to um, uh, base camp in okay. a place called Calvatar. But uh, I didn't know if I wanted to climb it. Uh, I've climbed a lot of mountains and I wasn't 100% sure. But when I got there... And salt, yeah, it's become a re-obsession. It's one of the things I have discussions with my daughters about because they're they're super worried. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing is, is that I hear, if you ever watch, get an opportunity to watch a, uh, a documentary called uh, 14, 14 Peaks uh, about a, a Nepalese climber who has uh, kind of revolutionized the industry. And not only that, he is working with the, the government in Nepal to uh, uh, reduce the number of permits that are allowed to climb Everest and one of those requirements being an 8,000 meter peak because most of the deaths that occur in there lately the biggest obstacle is really traffic jams uh, you have hundreds of people going for the oh, summit and really? you're at 26,000 feet in those temperatures you can't sit idle for hours on end I mean it's, it's literally a, a trail that wide you know uh, and so uh, a lot of people uh, are attracted to, to mountaineering things like that um, right. simply because they're successful in other fields maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer you're financially successful and you can drop a hundred grand to be drugged to the top uh, of a mountain. Uh, there's there's differences in climbing it. You watch a lot of. Uh, uh, there's another great documentary alpinist. Uh, you have some really talented uh, young climbers. For me, it's always been I'm six six two fifty, and people say you can't climb, just like they say you can't ever compete mountain biking, uh, things like that. And I, I continue to defy that because yes, I don't have a great uh, great physique for climbing. You should shorter people with a much better uh, uh, height height to weight ratio and balance and right. things like that. But uh, Again, it's one of those things a lot of people tell you can't do things, but uh, are you super like goal oriented? <laughs> like, so yeah. it's like tell tell me I can't do something and then I'm going to prove you wrong. One hundred percent, and yeah. not just that. I just think that I set goals, things I want to do. You do, and yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 I work. And are you through. super disciplined? It sounds like like if you wake up at six every day, like are you super yeah, my disciplined? My will tell you I'm super disciplined. Really? <laughs> I am. I don't. Uh, like people will tell me, hey. You know, I don't drink. I uh, have uh, being in the tattoo industry. People assume at some point I've done drugs or right. or that I get high. Uh, I don't. I don't do any of those things. It's uh, 
it's it's very important to me to to, to live healthy. You know, we were talking about dying earlier and, and fear of dying. Uh, I don't have a fear of dying, but but I I think you can make smart choices. Right. You know, and I think when it comes to your health, things like that. I, I just had an encounter with this uh, very awesome uh, lady that that worked at a hotel with us, and she was like, and she made a comment to me. She said, "I'm fat, diabetic." And I said, "Well, you know, both those things are fixable." Uh, mm. It's life choices that we make, and we all make life choices. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Uh, we, you get up and you decide every day, whether it's business, whether it's health, or any of these things. You know, uh, this is what I want to do, and you make an effort to do it. Uh, for for me personally, genetically, I have a family that you know, not not very good shape, uh, very big, and I just make a choice not to be that way. It sucks. I want to eat a bag of cookies. <laughs> I want to eat you know a whole bag of the Robin Egg Whoppers. It's Easter time, right? <laughs> but uh, you, you just make a decision not to do it. Do you ever yeah. have a cheat day? I do. Yeah. yeah. I love having a pizza or yeah. a burger with a bun. Uh, <laughs> the bun, that's a big uh, cheat. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I mean, uh, but again, it's a choice. I that... just saw this thing on Troy Aikman. Uh -huh. You know how they do men's health? They do, like, sometimes yeah. they'll do, like, a quick interview. Yeah. And he did a thing where, like, he showed his workout and he showed what's in his refrigerator. And then he said, you know, people will have, like, a cheat day during the week. Yeah. He's like, I will maybe do it once every four months. Like, yeah. super disciplined about, like, again, exactly. like, just kind of what goes in and how you feel. Well, the that. funny thing is, once you start eating like that, uh, you really don't want things that are, uh, someone, uh, all those stupid things, a little Debbie Star Crunch, someone brought it to the convention. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I have one. I was like, oh, man, I have had one of those since, like, high school, right? I did it, and I was like, what, like, <laughs> wax? I thought I had to immediately go brush my teeth, uh. But so once you start eating healthy, that's the nice thing about it is, is it transitions. But it's everything in your life to me. Uh, uh, discipline is, is, is the basis. I, I had a football coach that used to tell me, uh, you draw a line and you live above it. And I still have that sign Ooh. hanging in my office. And I, I, oh, I, I talk like to that. my kids about it all the time about we make a decision to live a certain way. Right. So we, we draw this line. And and then you have to continue to make the decisions to live a And it's it. not easy, right? Like that's no, the other thing I think. Like the mm -hmm. resilience we talked about earlier, things being difficult, and just pushing in that that discomfort. I feel like there's myself included. Like you spend a lot of your life trying to be comfortable, right? right. Like temperature, and you just think about like you, you know. And then when you're trying to start on your career, and you becomes you're just like, oh, I want financial security. I want right. like health security. You know, all these things that create comfort. And I think some of what you're talking about to kind of live above that line is uncomfortable. There is discomfort. One hundred percent. And like you spoke about finances, I think the number one mistake people make is our lives, our, our vision of success is 100% tied to finances, right? What we have, uh, and, and do we have two Mercedes or two BMWs? Do we have a 5,000 square foot house? Do I have seven uh, bathrooms? Do I have six flat screen TVs? And we laugh, but it's right. true. I grew up in a house that's 900 square feet and with four boys, two girls, and two parents. Um, and now I live in a house that's 5,000 square feet. I have one daughter who lives at home and it doesn't seem to be enough room for her. Uh, when, they were, when they were both young, um, we built this new home and had a buddy bath. And they were like, we have to share a bathroom? I was like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, yeah. when, like earlier we talked about flying and we talk about my daughters have never experienced because of my status with the airline, I, I don't I think they've flown coach once in their life, not because I pay for it, because they get that benefit from the airline. So it's hard to make that balance, right? It's hard to yeah. show them uh, what do we do? Do we move into a trailer? Do we live uh, purposefully poor to show our children that we had it uh, rougher? Uh, but but again, I think everybody ties it to finances. You know, money is not, and, and I've been uh, blessed uh, to, to do well. Nothing I have uh, that I would hold of value is anything I've ever bought with money. Uh, we talk about COVID, and I was so, so it's going to sound so selfish, but my daughter came home from college. My youngest was home. And not only were they home, they couldn't do anything, right? So I had it myself. We're playing board games. We're cooking. We're doing all these things that we lost touch with. And the things that truly make us happy, the memories you have, uh, like my grandparents, I can't tell you one thing they ever bought me, but I can tell you you taught me how to fish. You taught me how to shoot. You know, uh, time taking uh, uh, vegetable crates and making them into birdhouses. Things that we do of substance. And I, uh, I would tell people all the time, don't lose sight of, of happiness for money. Because I've never met anybody with money that is happier because they have money. In fact, I would argue the opposite. A, a lot of friends I have that have been successful have have uh, turned into the people I don't like. Um, right, because, you know, yeah. It, so, no matter what level of success I've achieved financially, um, I, I maintain the same friends, uh, the, yeah. the same friendship, the, things like that. Uh, 
And I don't think, I think it's the biggest mistake we make. I think money will follow if you follow your heart and do what you love. And the, the quant, quantity of life is not more important than quality of life. And I think people say to me all the time, hey, you got into all this travel, you're so lucky. You could do it. You make a choice to go into your nine to five because it's what's secure for you, right? I have a brother who, I don't know, maybe he makes $500 a week for round numbers. I was like, hey man, I'll start this business with you. I'll do all this stuff. You, you'll make, you'll kill it. There are people that won't risk right. uh, any anything yeah. because what they want is they, they're they afraid of the unknown, right? They, they won't ever take that gamble. And to me, you can always come back to that. You know, there's always something you can fall back on, a nine to five job or whatever. But if you want to do these things, you set those goals and you do them and you find a way. Like like young kids, go out and backpack, man. Go out and do things. You don't have responsibility yet. Once you get them, family, kids, things it's change. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you have three boys and we talked about it. Your life becomes about raising them. Right, right. right. Because it has to. I mean, yeah. that's the responsibility we have as parents. Uh, I say all the time, if, if, if pets, children, optional. Right? You don't have to have them, but you do have to take care of them once you, once you have them. Yeah. And if you do that at a young yeah. age, um, you know, I, th I think I'm going to run for, for president one day. And what I'm, I'm going to do is that you're going to get Social Security from 18 to 35, and then you can get a job and just work to your dad. You know, I still have your youth to it. There you go. I know. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. I know I've kept you almost um, too long, but I just have um, two quick questions. One, we started talking about it, I think, actually, when you, when you first got here. I just am curious because on the business side, you know, one of the things I'm passionate about is soft skills development. So communication mm -hmm. and collaboration and influence and this ability to like look someone in the eye. And in the story you told about the girl showing up to an interview in pajamas is, is in line with like, just in terms of your own, like the fact that you've had these different careers almost between military and then photography and then also within the tattoo space. Like what, what would you characterize as are some critical soft skills from your perspective that you think are important for people to be developing or thinking about? Well, I would say probably most important, and you touched on it, is the ability to have conversations with adults that's not through text and not through emails. One of the things we've lost today uh, in the younger generation, 100%, kids come in and they talk to me, even not about jobs, just about tattoos, and they can't look at you in the face. They can't articulate verbally, hey, what is it I want to say to you? Uh, they look at the ground, they look at their phone, uh, they, they just seem to have lost um, that, that skill set. And communication is one of the most important things. Uh, how a person shakes my hand or, or how they look at you, how they, they carry themselves um, it is, is important. Yeah. Um, I think it's something that's, that's been lost. Um, and then the only other thing as we wrap up, which I think you've alluded to, and I, I, I'd be really curious to your answer to this question because it seems like you're someone who has... Like you are like the definition of someone like kind of living life to the fullest. Seems like you seize the opportunities that have been presented to you. Is there anything that you would tell young Greg if you think about, you know, yourself at maybe, you know, 15, 18, 22, right? Is there any advice that you would give him that would help sort of the path be a little bit easier, right? Or anything that you would um, share with them in terms of kind of where you are now and the experiences that you've had. Any counsel? Yes, I would look at me and I'd say, Greg, the $25,000 you are going to put in Harley Davidson, put it in Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those, those those things. I mean, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? You look at things that we've done or, yeah. or uh, have done. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, you talk about this all the time. You talk about the butterfly effect. I don't know what right. I would change because right. there's so many times in my life decisions have led to uh, uh, incredible things. Some of them good, some of them bad. Uh, my children, uh, things uh, that you do that are negative that end up helping you in, in the long term. Uh, you know, the, uh, we all make decisions that maybe at the time seem bad and we struggle with. Uh, but they're all, at least for me, they, they, they've been learning, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's, uh, huge steps trying to make yourself better. Uh, I, I try to never stop doing that. I have a very good friend in Pennsylvania and he's, he, he got me hooked up with, I read a lot of books, uh, things about, um, you know, everything from management to managing yourself, um, right. you know, uh, managing, uh, how we interact, things we do, being able to step back and say, Hey, you know, you make mistakes and, and you grow from them. How I manage people now, you can talk to people that work for me and, and just over the last 15 years or 10 years, it changes. Um, yeah. 
I think that in curiosity and also to your point around, like even when you're talking about some of the activism work, like the things that it seems like you do, it there's like your passion and your love, but you're also continuing to be educated. And so there's this like reciprocal relationship, it seems like between, you know, sort of what you're giving and what you're getting back. At least that comes through during our conversation. It seems like there's this great connection between those different dimensions. Well, I try and I try to listen. Uh... You know, had a lot of conversations like we live around here into politics all the time. I have a very good friend of mine, an employee, and, and, and me and him are on. I would say I'm, I'm very conservative, uh, fiscally, uh, uh, constitutionally, but I'm also very liberal uh, when it comes to personal choices. Right. And, but me and him will have conversations. He's a very well educated, uh, has a master's degree, his, his wife has a doctorate. And, and they represent the academic side where I represent the reality side, but we'll, we'll clash. Uh, all the time, but I love it because I love having an educated conversation with people. I think one of the biggest things today that's wrong with the world uh, is people face no adversity, especially our children, things like that. They grow up hearing the word yes, never know. Uh, they're never no taught. conflict. Right. Exactly. But we also, that's reinforced on social media, 24 hour news channels. It is, we can have a conversation with someone else. I can disagree with you. That's okay. It doesn't make me racist, doesn't make me this, doesn't make me that. Right? I can have an educated point of view, uh, and I can share that with you, but today it seems like we can, and that's why we're so divided. People don't have conversations anymore. It's okay for you to be on the other side of the fence as me. It's okay for us to discuss that, but I find it mostly is 97% of us want the same things. Maybe we don't call it the same things, right. but we sit down and have a conversation, it's like, wow, man, we can work this out, but we seem to be governed or led by the 1.5% on this side and the 1.5% on that side, which, which play to the extremes. And it's unfortunate because people don't uh, talk. And that translates into business, it translates into everything. You run a business today, you have to be so neutral, you know, because you, you're, you, people are so afraid to stand for anything because they're afraid it's gonna alienate um, uh, part of that business. Where, whereas I think, you know, you can sit down and have conversations with people and, and make forward progress. For sure, and, um, for sure. Uh, yeah, so. Well, I can't thank you enough. This has been, I could talk to you forever. I feel like you have such a fascinating story and I appreciate like the depth that you went to and how you described your path. And I definitely uh, wholeheartedly tell people to go and check out your Instagram because it is so cool. (laughs) And um, I just love that we got to meet in person and thanks so much for being on this show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Greg, so much for this conversation. I loved all of your stories about the animals and your incredible photo shoots. Uh, Really enjoyed our conversations about what it means to be successful and what you're looking for in terms of people that you recruit and running your own business. I loved your comment around living above the line. And since we've talked, I've been thinking a lot about that. And really, what does that mean for me? Uh, What's my line and am I living above it? Of course, I love your comments around soft skills, those critical soft skills. You talked about the power of communication and the art of conversation. Uh, So much rich and great stuff in this interview. Thank you. And thank you to Missy, my producer on this episode, as well as Hannah. Thank you for your help. And thank you to our relatable community. If you get a chance and you like this conversation, please rate it or you can subscribe on both YouTube and on your favorite streaming platform. If you want to learn more about our sponsor, TFA Soft Skills, you can check us out at www.tfasoftskills.com. Until next time, this is Teresa Freeman with Relatable. Stay connected.